Well, I, Pastor, that was just a very nice way of saying I'm old. <laughs> now, the Beast Feast, I, we call it a Beast Feast. Uh, if I say that, you'll know I'm talking about your wild game dinner. Uh, boy, that was good. That was good. What a great evangelistic effort. And you folks really knocked it out of the park. I mean, that was a home run. I really enjoyed preaching. But I didn't, we were pressed for time, and he told me 20 minutes. Now, it took me 20 minutes just to propose to my wife. So, you know, you were, <laughs> folks, you can laugh, okay? It's okay. It's good therapy. Uh, and so I, I couldn't tell my honey joke, you know? So I've, you've got to hear it. Now, being in Michigan, this is a, man, this is a hunting state. Uh, I'm sure you've heard it, but if you have, just entertain me. Just laugh like you've never heard it before, okay? Uh, so I'm going to tell it now. You know, the, the scripture says, um, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. I've always wondered about that. You, he must be saying that people who have ears sometimes don't listen. When I was a young pastor, I had a real problem. I'm an expository preacher in Sunday school. You know, Baptists usually come in, in uh, uh, sequences to Sunday school. You have those that are early, those that are five minutes late, those that are 10 minutes late, those that are 15 minutes late. Now, it may not be that way here, but that's what I've experienced in Virginia. And I would start off and lay in a foundation for the passage and, and somebody would walk in and I'd think, I've got to start over. I like to never finish the lesson because of the groups coming in, you know. And so, you know, if you're a preacher or a speaker, you why speak if people don't hear you? Uh, it reminds me of the, uh, the guys who went elk hunting. Three of them were friends. There was a Baptist preacher, a forensics expert, and a lawyer. Unusual uh, uh, camaraderie, I guess. They went to Colorado. You know, Colorado has the largest herd of elk. And uh, you can buy a ticket, uh, uh, a tag across the counter out of state for bow. In fact, my son two years ago killed a six by a five by five uh, elk at 60 yards with a compound bow and uh we hear about that a lot and uh, uh so th these guys go hunting and they get out there within 35 minutes a world-class six by six elk steps out broadside they threw up their rifles simultaneously fired it sounded like one shot the animal fell immediately the lawyer said i know i killed that elk I mean, he said, and I, you know, I'm willing to take some legal steps to make sure I get that elk. Now, there's a friends, okay, but there's some things that go only so far as far as friendship. And the, the Baptist preacher just kind of mumbled to himself. He thought he killed it too. And the forensics expert said, look, we're friends. He said, now, you know, this is my expertise. He said, let me examine the animal for about 15 minutes. I could probably tell you who killed the animal. So he walked over and he was there about 15 minutes. He came back shaking his head. And the lawyer immediately said, what? He said, it's conclusive. He said, what do you mean it's conclusive? He said, the preacher killed it. He said, you better have some evidence, buddy, because we're taking this to court. He said, oh, yeah, there's evidence. And he said, what? He said, the bullet went in one ear and out the other. <laughs> now, how many have ever heard that? You heard that one? Yeah, man. You must have drove through Virginia or something. I don't know. Anyway, that's unusual. Most people have heard that before. But uh, that was my joke I didn't get to tell last night. So, you know, you'll have to tell it to all the hunters that didn't show up today. Solomon also said, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ways thereof lead to destruction. I want to preach a message when the sinner has his way. Proverbs 29.1 is the verse, but we're also going to read a complimentary passage after that in Proverbs 1, verse 22 and following. Proverbs 29, verse 1. The Bible says, He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That's a warning. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 22. 
This is a warning. How long, ye simple ones? That word simple means naive. Some people are naive about sin, aren't they? How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you, because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Verse 31. He turns them over to their sin. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. What a warning. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We do thank you for the privilege of preaching here for our story of Baptist Church and getting to know this dear pastor and people. Lord, we thank you for the folks that trusted you last night. Boy, I, I believe heaven's rejoicing today over that. And Lord, may you rejoice today as we believers get serious about dealing with sin in our own lives and realize how serious it is. If there's one here without Christ, Lord, I pray you convict their hearts and woo them to yourself and may they hear the message. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting. We can give a message by not speaking. And here, Solomon uses body language. You ever begin to witness to a person and they go, you ask a person, are they saved? And are they going to heaven? And they go, a stiff neck is usually connected to a callous heart. Nobody wants to hear that they're a sinner. Well, we are. Uh, there's a sinner preaching to you right now. And only by the grace of God is he going to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood. He uses body language here to illustrate rejection of spiritual correction. My first pastor, I started off with a young girl, 13 years old, who was rebelling against her parents. They never disciplined her. She had done everything that every parent didn't want them to do. And they finally, the health, uh, health nurse at school gave her some contraceptives, and the parents found it. First time that the father spanked her. She went to the social services, and they took her to court. And I had to, <laughs> new pastor, young, uh, 28 years old, and I had to go to court, and I was to be a character witness. They never called me because they, they, they were afraid to call me for what I'd say because uh, uh, anyway, they never called me, but the parents were going to send her to Lester Royal off school. If you understand about wayward children. And when they, the social service found that out, they immediately found a Southern Baptist school in Richmond to send her. This girl rebelled. I, she sat in my office after this incident before we went to court, and she just sat there, beautiful girl, just stared at me. You'd almost think she was even possessed. Never said a word. And I couldn't get through to her. And so she went uh, as a teenager to this home. She rebelled against the home, married a boy, then left him. One night, wee hours in the morning, she was probably on something. She was driving a car and ran head on into a oak tree and died instantly before she was 18 years old. This verse represents her. Now, I don't believe she was saved, but this also can apply to a believer who God corrects as far as their sin. Let me ask you a question. Did God have his way in your life this past week? You see, let me give you a spiritual diagnosis. If you were exposed to the truth of God's word this week, if you did not take God's advice and his medicine, you have built up a stronger resistance to God's cure for you. You see the word without remedy in Proverbs 29.1 is a medical term. It's mape, 
marpe. It means incurable. You know, if you let cancer go on so long, it becomes what? Incurable. And the only real cure is extraction. Take it out. Now, I know they have treatments today, but sometimes you have the treatments after they extract it. And so God wants to take the cancer out of our lives, but if you let it grow, you may reach a place where it's incurable. You see, the word without remedy literally means incurable. It's interesting. Our response to God when he deals with us is very important, even for a Christian, okay? Uh, If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar, 1 John says, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, a man's a rebel from birth, isn't he? The psalmist said we go astray from the womb as soon as we be born speaking lies. We don't like to be told we are wrong. We seek to justify ourselves when we are backed into a corner rather than change. And this verse I read is a warning. It's a real warning. Proverbs 1, 22 through 33 is a compliment on this warning. I call it the fed up passage. God says, you've gone over the line. Now I'm going to give you over to your sin. You keep drinking that hard liquor, and I tell you, you you should get off of it. Proverbs 23 says, look not on the wine when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. For at the last, it stingeth like an otter and biteth like a serpent. Who hath woe? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long in the wine, they that go to seek mixed wines. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. And thy heart shall utter perverse things. And the Bible at the end says that it's addictive. Uh, You have wounds without cause. You trip over things. Uh, You do immoral things when you're under the influence of alcohol. He says, you're like he that lieth down on the mask of a ship. Back and forth. I was smitten and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I'll seek it yet again. Addiction. If you're hung up on pornography, the only way to break that habit is just don't look. And by the way, if you don't look at wine, by the way, isn't it interesting you walk down the, uh, the wine aisle in, a, in a, a supermarket that are the most beautiful colors of anything, beverage in the, in the place. Coca-Cola is ugly, but it won't kill you. I don't think. If so, I'm dying. (laughs) He said, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I came from a drinking, fighting family. I know all about it. As a sophomore at Ferrum Junior College, I was unsafe. I've drank moonshine liquor. Never do that again. Even if I was still lost, I wouldn't do that again. That's crazy. You say, well, how'd you get here? By the grace of God. Yeah, I got saved at 20 years old, and I didn't become a sot. But the bottom line is, the bottom line is, this is a warning. God got fed up. Uh, Verse 31, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own ways and be filled with their own devices. The warning is simple. Unchecked sin leads to irreversible consequences. And that can happen to you as a believer. There's a progression in the verse. I'm going to give it to you, then I'm going to tell you about it, okay? Number one, God's reproof. What's that for? To convince you of sin. And in John chapter 16, I believe, when the Holy Spirit is promised by Jesus, he said he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The word reprove means to convince. He'll convince you of sin. That's God's reproof. Secondly, man's resistance. It means to be calloused by sin. And then sin's recourse to be destroyed by sin. Let's take a look at God's reproof. He being often reproved. Reproved comes from a primitive root. And I'll butcher it. Yakal. It means to judge, convince, argue, to correct. Now there are three things 
about God's reproof or correction. Number one, God deals with us when we sin. And as a believer, you're a child of God, and he loves you. In Hebrews 12, 6, as whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son, just like a father would discipline his son. And he said, if you don't receive chastisement, then you're, that word we don't like to permit, but it means illegitimate. You're not real. So every son he chastens. Have you ever sensed the chastening of God because something you thought or something you did or something you said? It happens to me all the time. You see, if you talk a lot like I do, you'll say something you shouldn't say. Only a fool would argue with God about sin. Solomon said, a reproof entereth more into a wise man than a hundred stripes in the back of a fool. So we'd, we'd be foolish to argue with God reproof. So the first thing, God deals with us when we sin. But aren't you thankful, number two, God deals with us more than one time. Aren't you glad, aren't you glad he spanks you more than one time? Takes you to the woodshed. He's not through with you. He's not through with you yet. He that being often reproved. Note the element of time. Proverbs 1, 22. The, the, uh, Solomon says, How long, ye simple ones, Will you love simplicity? And the word simplicity means naive. How long will you be naive about sin? You know, the problem with us, the devil will whisper, say, look, you're not that bad. I know somebody worse than you. Uh, you, can, you, can, you know, the, the sin that will hinder you from being all you can be for Jesus Christ is a sin that you tolerate, that you excuse. You know what an excuse is? The skin of a lot of stuff with a reason. You say, but it's not a big sin. They're all big. They're all big. big. And by the way, it's, you have the sins of commission, but there's also the sins of omission. James said, he that knoweth to do good, doeth it not to him it is sin. Every person I sat with on a plane, God pricked my heart about telling them. There was only one I couldn't talk to because they had earplugs on and never, never were, they were focused on uh, their phone. By the way, folks, Facebook is too much information. It's a good tool. I'm not against it. I've never been on it. I don't need it. I face the book. Okay? That communication I trust. If you get your theology from Facebook, you're going to end up being a nut because there's some crazies on there. There's some good people. But you better get your theology from this book here. We need to face the book. Amen? That's, that's not in the message. That's free. Okay? And so, number one, God deals with us when we sin. He loves us. God deals with us more than one time. Psalm 4, 2 says, O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity? The time element is important. Are you glad that God is patient with us? Pharaoh did get 10 opportunities and chances to repent, but he rejected, and his rejection took a toll, didn't it? And number three, God not only deals with us when we sin. He deals with us more than one time. God does not violate our will. Now there's some people who believe that God has already made all the choices for you. I am not a Calvinist. I'm a Biblicist. The Arminian fell off one end of the uh, log and the Calvinist fell off the other. I'm a Biblicist. I'm standing. I'm afloat biblically. And so uh you do have a choice. And you will make a choice about your sin. Your besetting sin. And everybody has a weakness. By the way, I told the man last night, you know, we put down a scent of tink and we, can, we try to trick a, 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 a big buck. You have to because the dummy in the woods is not the deer. It's the hunter. And I believe they got another sense we don't know anything about because I've been busted when I had done everything right and the wind was right. And all of a sudden he knew I was there. Why? I do not know. I was 22 feet off the ground. I had washed all my clothes. I didn't, I mean, I didn't walk in and sweat. I mean, everything was great. But the devil knows where your weakness is. is. We play on the buck's weakness to be able to harvest him or get a shot at him. But God does not violate our will. You will make up your mind about sin. You have the option to receive or reject God's counsel about sin. And God reasons with sinners. I taught in the fourth grade when I got out of college rather than coaching football because I believe God wanted me to go in Christian education. 
And I, I first verse I taught them was Isaiah 118. And uh, it's about the blood of Christ. Uh, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And I taught that to fourth graders. I learned it too, by the way. Teacher always learns more. By the way, I've had trouble with my voice, so I'm not drinking coffee, so don't get it's hot water. Now, coffee is hot water with flavoring, but this is no flavoring in it. God's reason with sinners is simply like this. What a plea. Come when? Now. You need to deal with sin now. Why? Because of your sin. It's scarlet. Because of God's holiness, it can make you white as snow. Aren't you glad? And because of God's cleansing, it shall be as wool. And so, God's reproof convinces us of sin. If you hear his voice, hide not your heart. Number two, man's resistance. That will we have. By the way, we have to give God a place to work. Psalm 119, wherewithal shall a young man, works for old men too, believe me. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. The difference between me now and the 20 years ago when I confessed Christ as my Savior is the word of God has been appropriated in my heart. Believe me, I had some rough edges that needed to be knocked off, and God knocked them off. I don't have a desire for alcohol at all. I think people are stupid to drink it. And I don't believe a Christian should. Dr. R.G. Lee, who was a, a medical doctor who went into ministry, taught his girls, the lips that touch wine shall never touch mine. Sounds good, doesn't it? All right. The hardening of the neck here has to do with resistance. The Hebrew word is kashal, to show stubbornness. You see, continued resistance against God's will is to stiffen your neck, which is connected to a calloused heart. This is the heart of communicating with the body language. You can, you ask your young person, where were you tonight? I mean, did you do anything wrong? You know what that means when you ask a, a teenager and they've done something wrong and they don't want to, uh, they're saying, Dad, take a hike. <laughs> Uh, you know, you can communicate with your eyes. Did you see the speaker of the house? Was he saying anything when, when our president was given the uh, uh, State of the Union? They played it up. He was going. I don't think he agreed with him. Do you? You think Nancy Pelosi said anything? She stood up and tore up uh, uh, Trump's speech. That was... That was really small of her. But we do say things with body language. So this is the heart communicating with the body language. Pharaoh is the classic example. God gave him 10 gracious reproofs. He hardened his heart until he was destroyed. By the way, he hardened his heart, but then God hardened his heart. There was a point where God said, you're going to drown. You're done. The plague increased from inconvenience to pain to loss to death. Blood, frogs, lice, flies, moran, boil, hail, locust, darkness, and then death. There's a progression. Secondly, to resist spiritual correction makes us vulnerable to the dangers of that sin shall suddenly be destroyed. That's a warning, isn't it? Proverbs 127 says, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. That's a cyclone. If you go back to chapter 29 of Proverbs, verse 6, there's two words. I'm going to read that verse. It says, in the transgression, that means when you're involved, of an evil man, there is a snare, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. Now, 
the word transgression, in the translation, in the transgression literally means in his rebellion and snare, mokashi, to trap. In your rebellion, you will put your foot in the trap. And Solomon said also, the way of transgressors is hard. Trans means to align. Aggression means to step over that line. And ladies and gentlemen, you can send to a point, if God deals with you over and over, that you step over a line. And when you do, you're caught. You're caught. Uh, the Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Let me read you a, just an unbelievable story, an illustration, about what we're preaching here. The title is, His Was a Shocking Change of Heart. A brilliant young man once wrote, Our heart, reason, history, and the work of Christ convince us that without Him, we cannot achieve our goal, that without Him, we are doomed by God, and only Christ can save us. Pretty good statement, isn't it, for a teenager? These thoughts of a mere 17-year-old revealed spiritual wisdom beyond his age and insights that few attain. He had been baptized at the age of six into the Lutheran church in 1824 and was confirmed at 16. Now to graduate from high school, he had been required to write an essay on a religious subject. He chose to explore the subject of the union of believers with Christ according to the Gospel of John. He explained that the fruit of our union with Christ is our willingness to sacrifice ourselves for our fellow man and the joy which the Epicureans in their spiritual philosophy sought in vain is a joy known only to the innocent heart united with Christ and through Christ to God. So wrote the young Karl Marx. Do you know who Karl Marx was? Who wrote the Communist Manifesto? But in 1844, just nine years later, he had abandoned any Christian commitment he may have once had. In fact, his new ideas established him as one of the most influential atheists of history. Worse, his ideas spawned through the former Soviet Union and Communist movement one of the greatest epics of human misery and death in history. This radical change of heart is astonishing and difficult to understand, but it shows the horror that can occur if a person turns away from the light that has been given him and rejects the love and mercy of our Savior. Unbelievable. You say, I can't explain that. My first explanation is, well, he really was religious and had a zeal for religion and wasn't saved. That's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. You see, be sure your sin will find you out. Temptation is something we all experience. James said, let no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. For God tempteth no man, neither can he be tempted with evil. For a man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust is conceived. So when lust conceived, is conceived, sin is conceived, and when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. There's destruction. There's the process. There is a line. I want to talk to you lastly. We talked about God's reproof. He convinced you of sin. Listen. Deal with it. Don't harden your neck. Uh, man's resistance. But what about sin's recourse? And that without remedy, a point of no return, there is a line that a person crosses. And that, when that occurs, God gives us up to our sins. Go to Romans chapter 1 very quickly. This gives the process. It's very interesting. Romans chapter 1. And I'm just going to read verses 21 through 25. Now, you probably know the passage. In fact, I'm going to start in verse 18. It says, for the wrath of God, that's God's judgment, is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, un ungodliness, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because, here's the reason, 
That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. The creation, God deals with our hearts. Uh, we're vulnerable. We're without excuse. Verse 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. It'd take me forever to expound that, but the creation proves that there's a God. Why? Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fool. And amazing, I'm sure Karl Marx thought, I'm wise for rejecting the light I was given. He looks at darkness and says, that's light, and looks back at the light he was given and calls it darkness. They're fools. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, here's the, here's, the, here's the line that's drawn. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Hey, we save the whales and kill the babies now, don't we? For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiveth in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. Ladies and gentlemen, the homosexual crowd, the woke crowd, they're at the bottom of the room. But that's not the end of it. Look at this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And he goes on and lists the sins. And, and, it, and it goes on to say that, we actually invite people to join us even though we know that the God's wrath is upon those who perform those sins. How crazy is that? He says he gave them up to sin, twice gave them over to sin. A reprobate mind is a mind who cannot judge from right or wrong. And we live in that culture. If you think this culture is going to lead you to victory in Jesus Christ, you are blinded and you have your head in the sand. This culture is against you honoring and living Jesus Christ in your daily walk. And you know, let me tell you something, folks. I preached to a bunch of teenagers last week in, in Indiana. And I said, you know the problem in life is so daily. You put your feet on the floor every morning. You decide whether you're going to be controlled by the Spirit of God or not. And I've, I've made this a habit. This morning, I put my feet in. Sometimes I don't do it because I'm not usually awake and conscious when I put my feet on the floor. But when I am conscious, I say, Lord, good morning. This is the day that you have made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And I say, God, this is your day. And if you, if you don't do that, if you don't talk to him, you don't realize that you're vulnerable and you don't realize this thing of living for Christ is daily. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. That verb is be being filled. That means there's one baptism when you're saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and there are many fillings and you decide every day whether you're going to live for Jesus Christ. You've got to be scripturally full. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor sitteth in the seat of scorner. For he is a for, and, or standeth the way of sinners for his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law that he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree not a poke solid that grows by the waters and to bring it forth his leaf bring it forth his fruit and his season his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper hello life is so daily isn't it and I want to encourage you that hey, I'm telling you it's not easy to live for God in this culture I tell teenagers, we're, we're just saying, well, you get saved, you know, bless God, give your life to God. How are you going to give your life to God? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Scripturally strengthened through the word. Folks, that takes a holy habit you've got to do. You've got, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I'd rather pick up a hunting magazine to pick up my Bible in the flesh. 
Really. Some of you'd rather look and see well, who's, who's Facebook's you and look at the bottom. I, I understand that. You have to make a deliberate step to open your Bible and read it. You're not going to feel good about reading your Bible until you start reading it. You're not going to feel good about giving, as I taught this morning, unless you start doing it. You're not going to feel like praying and talking to God until you start doing it. And that's when, if I might use a word, you have a spirit that enjoys it. So what are we saying? The recourse. The recourse. Proverbs 5 talks about the person who's immoral. And he says, he shall be holding with the cords of his sin because you won't step away from it. Talks about a strange woman and being involved with him. It goes on. Listen, this is true of, of sexual addiction and it's true of alcohol addiction as I quoted this morning from Proverbs 23. My friend, God is not mocked. You reap what you sow. Notice how God gets the last laugh not the rebel in Proverbs 1, 26, as we read. God became sarcastic toward our, he comes, becomes sarcastic toward our calamities in verse 26. He laughs. He says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when you fall down in the street from your alcohol. I had a friend that I grew up with, Frank Moritz, called me one night. He was, he was high. I said, Frank, I'll be glad to talk to you, but I'm not going to talk to you while you're drinking. You're not going to remember what you did. He came to church. He never got over it. I heard about six or seven years ago that he fell in front of a trolley car down in New Orleans drunk, and it ran over him. It's a typical story of the drunk. God shall, he not only will laugh at you, when God laughs at you over your sin because he turned you over, that's a bad place to be, folks. And then secondly, he is silent when we call. Verse 28 of Proverbs 1. Then shall they call, but I will not answer. That's a terrible place to be. And then number three, God becomes scarce when we seek for him. Verse 28. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Sin follows this course in a person's experience. Number one, it defiles. Number two, it desensitizes. Number three, it dominates. And number four, it destroys. Jesus, James chapter 1, I read that. When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So what's my conclusion? How do we wrap this up? First of all, what does the verse say to us in Proverbs 29.1? He that being often reproved, Hardness his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and die without remedy. God's reproof. Man's resistance. Sin's recourse. Stop taking God's grace for granted. The most vulnerable person is a person who sits in a church like this that hears the message every week that a preacher resounds the gospel and preaches on the different sins and God pricks our heart and we say, well, I'll be okay. And we walk out and we never deal with it. That's the most vulnerable person here. Stop playing around with pet sins. God is not willing to let you live with that sin. God will turn you over to that sin. Listen to me, friend. You won't know that you have crossed that line of no return until you hit the oak tree like Cheryl Tillman did. That young girl that I counseled, that rebel, rebel, then she knew for a moment. It's time to stop playing spiritual roulette with sin. The muscles in your neck may be tightening as far as resistance. I'll tell you one illustration. My daddy was a, was a carpenter, and he built our garage. Too, and as he did it, he didn't have anybody helping him. We were little junior-age boys, and my brother and I just run around playing. And he had dropped a lot of nails, and he didn't want to go around fishing them out. Some of them had gotten in the ground. My daddy brought this great big old horseshoe magnet home. He said, boys, I'm going to tie a rope on this. It took both of us to drag it. He said, I want you to drag it around this building. And we'd drag it around that building, and we'd come back and be nails all over it. And we'd pick them off and put them in the trash can. Well, after we picked up all the nails that we thought we could get, we started playing with it. And we'd go in the garage, and we'd lay a nail on the floor. 
and we'd see if we could beat that magnet, and we'd get as close as we could get and try to jerk it back, but it was too heavy. And we'd get real close to that nail. Boy, it'd get us. Bam, it'd get us. And that's what some people are playing with sin. You're saying, I can get so close to it, but I ain't going all the way. And then one day, God says, you stepped over the line. I've counseled you. You won't respond. I'm going to give you to that sin. And maybe that will rebuke you. I don't wish that on anybody. But that's God's word. Hear him today. Deal with that pet sin that haunts you. And God will use your life like he's never used it before.